Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we are going through the entire book of Revelation on YouTube, online, uh, for study. And if this is your first time with us, welcome. You're more than uh, welcome to start right here with us if you'd like, especially if there's a passage that we're going to be reading today that you're particularly interested in. Otherwise, you can go back and start from the beginning. Uh, grab your Bibles, and we're going to be heading down to the bottom of Revelation 8. We're seeing uh, various judgments running down on the earth. Uh, John's in heaven. He's in the throne room of God. He's standing in God's presence. Jesus has the scroll of life, and he's popping seals off of it. And with each seal, something takes place. And so Revelation 8 was a series of judgments on the earth. We saw fire raining down from heaven, blood raining down from heaven, a meteor strikes the earth and poisons all the water. The sky is turned dark. And Revelation 8 verse 13 ends, Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. So this eagle flies over, surveys everything, says, ugh, it looks terrible down there, but it's going to get a lot worse. And it does. Revelation 9, it, get, it gets worse. <laughs> Revelation 9 begins, And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Now, what does that mean? What does star mean here, right? Because I think star can have a couple of different meanings. We can, we can translate that a couple of different ways. I mean, first, it could be an actual star, right? It could be a meteor, some sort of space object that strikes the earth and makes a hole in the ground. Or it could also be an angel. Sometimes uh, angels, messengers from God, uh, carry that same uh, star word. So it could be an angelic being, and I'm going to lean more towards that. And here's why. It says he, right? It says he. It doesn't say it. So there's a personification that goes along with the star, and it says he was given. He was given a key, and he opened something. So this sounds more like it's an angelic messenger. And what does the angel open? He opens a bottomless pit. Now you could say, well, obviously that's, that's hell, right? Well, the Bible doesn't say it's hell. And I think if the Bible meant hell, it would have said hell. Uh, I think if Bible translators, when they translate things into English for us, if they had assumed it was hell, they probably would have written hell as well. But it doesn't say hell, it says bottomless pit. Which makes us think of the time Jesus cast out legion. When G Jesus visited the Decapolis, he met a man that was possessed by many demons. Jesus said, you know, who are you? And the, the demon said, we are legion. And Jesus was going to exercise the demons from the man's body. The demons begged Jesus, please do not send us to the bottomless pit. They don't say hell. And Jesus used the word hell very, very much. So they said, don't send us to the bottomless pit. So Bible scholars believe that the bottomless pit is some sort of holding area for demonic forces. It's like a, let's call it a jail, okay? It's a jail where demons are sent as a, as a holding place. And this angel is given a key to unlock that holding place and unleash demonic forces on the earth. Verse 3 says, Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Remember, um, when the plague of Egypt hit, there was also a plague of locusts. There was also a plague of darkness, just like we've seen. There was also a plague of the rivers turning to blood, like we've seen. Certainly a lot of mirroring taking place. But in the Egypt story, the locusts devour all the food. Here, the Bible makes a specific note to say, these locusts don't destroy food, which is what they would normally do. Rather, these locusts sting. They sting people, okay? They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Wow. Th this part of Revelation is so incredible, right? There's this spectacle 
that you just can't even imagine. There's something taking place that you couldn't even imagine in your wildest dreams. You know, people say, oh, I want to be there in the end times when, when, when they get theirs, right? When the people get punished. But we do not want to see this. We do not want to see this. Again, um, just like Egypt, there's this plague of locusts, but instead of attacking the crops, they attack people. They sting them, the Bible says here, for five months. For a five-month period of time, um, people are receiving the sting from the scorpion, and it's a, an infection. These people get diseases, and it, it, it hurts so bad, it makes you want to die, but you don't die. Can you imagine for five months begging for death and not being able to die? Verse 7 says, The appearance of the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold. Their faces were like human faces. Their hair like women's hair, and their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions, and their power to hurt people for five months is in their tail. So again, this five-month period, right? They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek, he is Apollyon. So um, there seems to be some sort of ruler that's ruling over this plague of locusts, and this ruler's name is the Destroyer, okay? So more weirdness, more strangeness, right? Locusts that don't look like locusts. Locusts that have human faces and girl hair and crowns and breastplates. What, what, what is, what's going on? Is, does John just not know how to describe what he's seeing? I, well, I think so. I do. But John's also familiar with what locusts look like, right? It would have been common uh, for him to see large grasshoppers where he lives. And he's saying, these don't look like any locusts I've ever seen, right? So when we said earlier that the angel was unlocking some sort of doorway to a demonic prison, what we see are um, some sort of demonic animal, right? Some sort of demonic locust, some sort of otherworldly creature that attacks the people. Now, why, why does it look like this? Why not just have it look like a normal locust? Well, I think sometimes it's, things are done for shock value. You know, if you see something that you've never seen before, let's say, let's say you're, you're living in those times and one of these demonic beings comes up on you and, and stings you and people are trying to figure out what's going on. Well, the first thing they're going to say is, this doesn't look like anything we've ever seen before. We don't know what this is. We don't know how to address it. We don't know how to win against it or to, how to attack it. Or we don't know how to create an antidote for it. This is unlike anything we have ever seen. And I think certainly that's what's taking place. God is making it obvious you are not being attacked by anything of this earth. You are being attacked by demonic forces. You are being attacked by the spiritual realm. And it's so that it would be obvious. People should see it and just realize this is, this is punishment. This is the end times, right? Now, after all of that, will people repent and turn to God and say they're sorry and uh, confess and believe? Probably not. Even with something as ugly as this, destructive as this, people are going to wish for death, they will still have hardened hearts. This is the lesson we learned from Egypt. After all the plagues, Pharaoh still has a hardened heart, right? No matter what plague attacked his people, even to the death of his own son, he, his heart remained hard. So, are we to assume then that only atheists can have a hardened heart? No. A hardened heart is somebody who just doesn't obey God. It's somebody who knows what they are supposed to do, and they stubbornly refuse. Just like you telling your child to clean their room, and they refuse. And they're just foot down, arms crossed, not going to do it. That's a hardened heart. Hardening someone's heart doesn't just happen because God hurt them or they're unwilling to believe. I think there's our, there are Christians that have hardened hearts. There are people in your church that have hardened hearts. Hebrews 3 says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who let left Egypt led by Moses. The author of Hebrews says, you know, we seem to remember uh, Pharaoh as being the person who had the hardened heart, but the author of Hebrews says, don't forget, the Israelites 
as they wandered in the desert, also had a hardened heart. After they got out into the desert, their hearts turned hardened and they refused to obey, so much so that God punished them and never let them enter the promised land. Hardening of the heart doesn't have anything to do with atheism or socialism or communism or anyism, right? Hardening your heart is a response that you adopt towards God. You refuse to obey. You acknowledge that the Bible is the word of God. You read it, you go to church, you know what you're supposed to do, and yet you don't. And you say, you know what? My way is better. My way is better than God's. Yes, I know what I'm supposed to do, but I'm not going to do it. And here's why. Christians like to justify their sin, justify the reason why they choose not to obey. That's a hardened heart. If we pursue our own interests and our own darkness, and we disobey the Bible, if we pursue selfishness, the Bible says we have a hardened heart. Now, what's the, what's the answer? Well, I think the opposite would be a soft heart, or we would say a humble heart. Maybe the King James would say a contrite heart. Humility is in realizing that I don't drive the ship, I don't hold the remote, I don't Uh, steer the car, right? I, I give that over to God. I don't lead down the path. As long as we are leading down the path, we are stubbornly following our own self interests our own desires, and we're not following God. And as long as we're not following God, we're on the path of those with the hardened heart. I don't want to be on that path. I think some self examination is always Um, a good idea when reading these chapters in Revelation and asking, do I have any of this in me? You know, if I saw God's punishment and it was obviously God, right? It couldn't be anything else. I am being attacked by darkness. I am being attacked by demonic forces. Why? What am I doing wrong? You, it's a wake-up call to turn and do something different, to, to leave behind my own interests, my own pursuits, the things that I want And I need to turn and follow God. That's repentance. Repentance comes as an action of humility, a humble heart saying, I need to follow God. I need to put him first. I'm a follower. As we read Revelation 9, I would ask you to look at the path you're on and see if you are indeed following with a humble heart. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.